Hey troops, what's going on? Gen Dead Commando here and welcome to the channel guys. So today we are talking military history of Sweden again and today we're on the Middle Ages guys. There's quite a bit of content on this. I'm not sure if we're going to cover it all in today's kind of video but um, I'll see how far we go. We're just going to go with it and i hope you enjoy it guys if you did like this last one i've had a lot of positive feedback actually of the military history kind of playlist that we're creating here then smash that like button subscribe to the channel if you're brand new here and all of the links to my various in um different social media accounts are in the description guys you can do things such as visit the merchandise store you can go to instagram um tiktok twitch We've got the Discord server, uh, donations, you can become a member there, all of that good stuff, guys, all right? But today we are on the Middle Ages, Sweden. So, troops, without further ado, let's just get straight into it. And, um, yeah, the last um, the last uh, video we did, we talked about prehistoric Sweden and the Viking Ages, and we covered the Battle of Svalda. Uh, we talked about Olof. We talked about Ladang, which was a form of conscription to, to, to somewhat extent. And um, we talked about Svea and the Gotta Kingdoms a little bit. And it was quite um, it was quite interesting to, to just look into the early kind of, the earlier days really and to see what it was all about. Because I'm, like you say, I'm reacting to different videos um, based on Sweden at the moment. And I just want to know a lot more about the country. It's a country that I have a, a massive interest in at the moment. So, um yeah, I hope you guys can appreciate it. And I've just realised we're not playing any games today. I don't need these headphones. So I can take them things off. We can chill. We can chill today, guys. So, um, yeah, let's get these, uh, let's get this stuff up. So today we're on the Middle, e Middle Ages, guys. And now I'm using, um, I'm using Wikipedia of all sorts. What I'm going to do in the future is, um, once I know a little bit more and I start looking into these people, I'm going to start reacting to certain videos based on this content. So there will be reactionary videos come off the back of this as well, guys. So look forward to that, yeah? So the Middle Ages then. The Russo-Swedish War, 19, uh, 1495 to 97, was a result of an alliance between Ivan III of Russia and Hans of Denmark. Okay. It was uh, waging war against the Stuart family of Sweden in the hope of regaining the Swedish throne. Uh, so it was a battle between the crown then at the time then, guys, yeah? Stuff that we just wouldn't see happening now in today's uh, in, in today's modern society. We just wouldn't see battles for the throne. It just wouldn't happen. Ivan III sent Princes Dani, Skenia and Vasil Skuski to lay siege to the Swedish castle of Vyborg. The siege lasted for three months. Wow, three months, man! That would be that would be hard to kind of manage in today's um, in, in in modern society, guys, with all of our modern equipment and stuff like that, and the G4 chain. It was still struggled to you know to to pull off anything more than three months, guys. It ended with a uh, Castellan set his supply on power uh, of powder on fire. Set his supply of powder on fire. What kind of powder are we talking about there then? As a result of the alliance between Grand Prince Ivan III of Moscow, blah, 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 who's waging war, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so that's just not, that's not really going into much detail. We'll click on that later, guys. This scaring the Moscovites out of the wits, as the Swedes records say. The following year, Russian generals Vasil and Andre severely devastated Swedish Finland as far as Hamanlina. Another detachment sailed along the shore, forcing the Finns into subservience. Ah... Getting Finland involved now. Sten Stur the Elder, who was then at Turku Abo, was enraged at the news of the Russian expedition and sent Svante Nilsson with 2,000 men to um, take Ivan Gord. A new fortress which Ivan III had built to protect Russia, Ingria, against Livonian. The fortress was taken, but was impossible to defend it for a considerable period of time. Why was it impossible to defend for a considerable period of time? I want to find that out. If you know in the chat, guys, let us know, yeah? Svant proposed to hand it over to the knights, an offer which they declined. Thereupon the Swedes set the fortress ablaze and sailed home. <laughs> Whoa, okay. So they weren't listening. They just went, right, okay, you don't want to take our offer? We're going to throw matches and uh, see you later, guys. We're not bothered about what you want. That's one way of doing it, I suppose. After the Swedish throne fell to hands of Denmark, 
Hostilities were suspended until 1508 when Sweden and Russia ratified a peace treaty for 60 years. That's quite a long time for back in the day. Sweden and Russia would fight many wars in the following centuries. All right, let's look into this uh, Russo-Swedish War, 1495 to 97. What we got here? Right, the Russo-Swedish War of 1495 to 1497 was a result of an alliance between Grand Prince Ivan III of Moscow and Hans of Denmark, who was waging war against Stuart family of Sweden in the hope of regaining the Swedish throne. Right, okay. So, Pusa to the agreement, Ivan III sent uh, Princess Daniel and Vasil Shusky to lay siege to the Swedish castle, uh, castle of Vyborg. Right, I've read that before. What else have we got here? What else have we got? An explosion. The memory of the immense explosion in the Vyborg Castle on the 30th of November 1945 survived in Finnish and Russian folklore. Here we go again with the folklore, guys. That's all we had to go off back in the day, though, right? You know, we might have had a couple of dits, people spinning stories, writing them down a couple of hundred years later, and then that's it. Probably some of the following stories are later inventions. We've just spoken about that, haven't we? A contemporary popular poem narrates the story of this blast. So, Honus Magnus included the Vibol blast in 1536. Magna Carta, right? That is very, very interesting. Well, it must have been a significant blast if it was... Uh, even if people are talking about it and it is folklore, it's something that's um, been significant enough to, to cause people to talk, and to talk for quite a few years. Okay, so the defence of Vyborg was led by its castle, uh, castellan, Lord Nutpos. Muscovites invaders were just about to conquer the town, according to folklore. Nutpos had caused the blast with some sort of exploding mixture. Okay. Other stories allege that the phenomenon was a figure shown against the sky and depicted, for example, the X-formed cross of St. Andrew. Right, so we're getting... You know where these folklore um, stories start coming in when they start putting a little bit of a religious twist on it. At the time, all right, we were um, we were aware from the last kind of video that Christianity was just swooping across the land, guys. And there you go, there's religion, you know. It's almost like a scaremongering tactic that's... Uh, yeah, that that's occurring here. It's, oh, it's a, it's a religious thing. It's a sign, and you know, trying to dictate people's actions thereafter. Um, yeah, if you're non-religious like myself, then you'll 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 just look at that and go, well, that clearly had no religious um, significance whatsoever, and it wasn't an X-formed cross of Saint Andrew at all. It was just an explosion. It wasn't a phenomenon. Let me know in the chat what you think, guys. Um, because I was actually raised in the Christian, uh, the Catholic Church, and um, you know, I, I went my own way with religion um, later on in life. Um, I made my own mind on it after I'd seen uh, the, the world and, and done a lot of traveling. I even visited uh, the Holy Lands in Israel, and um, it um, it just cemented it even more to me that um, yeah, there's a def I definitely have a respect for religion and the culture and the uh, the literature. Behind it, I think there's some of the greatest literature um, ever written in is in the religious texts. But um, I, I don't take any of it literal now, you know. So um, I'm just looking at that as a little bit of scaremongering because Christianity was kind of swooping through the lands at the time, and they were definitely trying to take hold of Europe and uh, get um, all of the you know the thought pattern from the pagan paganism to to Christianity to, to kind of take hold a little bit more than it was, all right? That's what I'm taking of it. What do you think of that, guys? There are different opinions on the hist uh, of the historicity and the real events of the phenomenon. Yeah. Phenomenon, I don't, think, I don't think it was a phenomenon at all. I just think it was a blast, you know. There were only a couple of thousand soldiers on the Swedish side and the defenders attempted to recruit peasants to add to their numbers. The first Moscovite attack was successful, uh, successfully repelled, but in late November, the Moscovites attacked with all their forces. The battle seemed lost. The attackers had succeeded in reaching the tops of the Vyborg town wall, and several towers were in their power. After that, something happened which caused Muscovites to retreat. Something happened that probably... Hmm, was it... Was it even... 
I guess we'll find out in the next paragraph if it was documented or not. So something happened which caused the Muscovites to retreat. Something significant then. It has to have been. If they were taking the uh, taking the lead and advancing. And seemed to be doing quite well. One story narrates that the nut had a powder uh, had a powder mine or tar barrels under the one tower. Which he detonated. Muscovites alive after the explosion would not have known what happened. And escaped in great fear. Another story tells of Muscovites escaping because they became afraid of a light phenomenon in the sky. 30th November is the Feast of St. Andrew. And they thought the saint was protecting the town, making them halt their attack. So there you go. That's a prime example of religion. Um, it's, you know, they, they've, they, they've, they've got a fear around their, their actions because of the scriptures, because of a religious story because of a religious ideology an idea in their brain which today in the same area wouldn't last those stories wouldn't last they wouldn't take hold they wouldn't have no real significance they wouldn't change people's um what's the word i'm looking for it wouldn't change a situation guys it wouldn't change people's mindset on a situation this situation was changed completely um, allegedly from religion yeah so they became they became afraid of a light phenomenon in the sky so that's yeah that's, that sounds what do you think uh, what do you think about that guys I mean I can understand why they would probably feel a little bit afraid because back then the brains and everything was so channeled into it religiously that they probably would believe these types of things. So, a light phenomenon in the sky, or powder mine or tar barrels exploding, you know, that would do a similar thing. It would create a, a blast, a light blast, a bomb blast, which would seem like a phenomenon. If you've never seen it before, guys, if you've, you've, got, you've got to understand this, we see this stuff all the time on TV, on... YouTube and everything else. These guys have got no real understanding. Some of them might have never seen anything like this in their entire lives. They would have been petrified at seeing something like this. And especially if the scriptures were drummed into the brain in a certain way. It could uh, certainly have a an effect on their mentality and their thought pattern. So I can understand why they'd think that actually. Definitely can. So, Russell Swedish War. 1495 to 1497. Again, this whole thing here I'm taking from all of this here is events at the time were orchestrated, were dictated by um, religion, the ideologies of Christianity. Um, that's all. That's what I'm taking from that, guys. That's what I'm taking from. I don't know if you're taking anything else from that, but that's what I'm taking from it. I want to have a look at this Ivan the Third guy, but I'm gonna. Go back first. In fact, yeah, Ivan the Third of Russia. Let's have a look at this guy. Seems to be a bit of a geezer, him. Ivan the Third, twenty second of January, fourteen forty, Moscow. Twenty seventh of October, fifteen o five. Sixty five years old, guys. It's quite old for back in the day, really. Also known as Ivan the Great. It's of all that good food he's eating, isn't it? Because he's rich. Was a Grand Prince of Moscow and Grand Prince of all Rus. Ivan served as the co ruler and regent for his blind father, Vasil II, from the mid 1450s before he officially ascended the throne in 62. He tripled, in, he tripled the territory of his state, ended the dominance of the Mongols, Tatars over Russia. Wow, so he ended the dominance. That's really interesting. I wouldn't mind looking into that. That's a great bit of history there, troops. And I bet you that was a bloody, bloody hard, hard felt war. And it's got to have been fought over long periods of times because the Mongols and the Tatars were a tough bunch of people. Renovated the Moscow Kremlin, introduced a new legal codex and laid the foundations of the Russia state. It's pretty impressive, like, you have to admit, guys. That's pretty impressive. 
His 1480 victory over the Great Horde is cited as the restoration of Russia independence 240 years after the fall of Kiev to Mongols' invasion. Ivan was the first Russian ruler to style himself Tsar, albeit not as an official title. Though marriage to Sophia, he made the double-headed eagle Russia's coat of arms and adopted the idea of Moscow as third Rome. His 43 Your reign was one of the longest in Russian history, second only to his grandson, Ivan. Right, okay. So, this geezer was a hard case. He had bottle, he had balls again. That's what I'm sealing with the... You know, when you look at the the rulers of back in the day, you look at modern day rulers, they rule by... um, We like to say moral example, don't we? If they're morally and ethically orientated well um or at least they seem to be orally uh, at least seem to be in the public eye morally and ethically well then they're liked they have a more um power and persuasion across the land back in the day it didn't really matter too much about morals or ethics it seemed to me that strength dominance Guts, determination, ballsiness, grit, all of these old school hard attributes really paid well. And fear. I think fear was a main, main thing back in the day as well. You know, you feared these people. Those who had the ability to instill instill the most fear into the people of the land, gained more respect of people of the land, had potential to take over more land. I mean, uh, you know, to to be dominant over the Mongols and uh, Tatars over Russia, you've got to be, you've got to be ruthless, haven't you? You can't really survive for 65 years as well. So he's uh, he's probably been a real tough, hard person, like, you know, 100%. We've got quite a bit of stuff on this guy, actually. Expanding the territory of Moscow. I think we're going to look into... The next video, I think we're going to look into Ivan the Third of Russia, because there's a lot of history about this guy. I want to know about this man. I'm really interested in the old school kind of tough kings and rulers and all of that. I'm interested in the psychology of it. I've um, watched a few videos on. Well, I've watched a lot of videos on Mike Tyson, and um, he talks about it in a similar way that I'm interested in it actually. He talks about these old greats in a in a way that um, how can I put this? He liked to study the mindset, so he he used that mindset actually when he was um, when he was in the boxing ring and when he was training, he wanted to study conquerors so he could have that the similar similar mentality, and you could see that conquering kind of mentality come through in the way he trained and the way he portrayed himself throughout his life and. Uh, I think it's really really interesting. I'm not saying I'm going to do that. I just want to understand the mentality of these guys, you know. Um, because it's really, really interesting. I want to know where that went. How how have we changed? What's changed in society so that the rulers of our lands have changed? Something's had to have happened. There's a shift, hasn't there? I think it's got a lot to do with morality and, ethicness, uh, and, and ethics, guys. But um, we're on about 18, 19, nearly 20 minutes now, guys. I'm going to keep these to about 20 minutes long, so we're not talking too much. So today we've talked over the Middle Ages, and we've also talked over briefly on the Russo-Swedish War, 19, uh, 1495 to 97. I'm sure we could talk and expand on that quite a bit. And we've talked about Ivan the Third of Russia, which is going to be the next video, actually. I think there's a lot of things we can uh, we can enjoy about learning about Ivan the Third of Russia, actually. And um, we're going to move on to the rest of the Middle Ages stuff. Hands of Denmark, Stuart, Sweden, the Moscovites. I want to know what happened in Vyborg. That siege at Vyborg is probably... I wonder if there's any videos on that, guys. If you know there's any videos on this stuff, then let me know. And... Um, yeah, if you're enjoying these guys as well, I know it's only 20 minutes of me kind of talking and sharing a few of my opinions on uh, 
this kind of stuff but i think it's really interesting i'm i'm i can't wait to see where it takes us as well i mean we could probably be talking about the swedish history um and the swedish military history for the next year or so so um stay tuned guys there's a lot uh, we're going to cover and it's only going to get better in terms of the content if we need to go over in terms of time slightly to get a little bit more stuff in then we'll do that um but yeah that's the middle ages we've only scratched the surface with that so i'm uh probably going to go over a few more things within that middle ages section before we move on to the early vasa era where we talk about the swedish war of liberation we talk about their delegati campaign which i've heard a lot about we're going to talk about the ingrian war we're going to talk about the kalmar war the polish swedish wars the 30 years war which has a lot of history guys a lot of history about it all right but that's it guys i think i might put a poll out actually what you want the next history video to be on all right so stay tuned and that's what that's that's what i'm going to do i'm going to put a poll out for so you guys can choose and uh you can kind of choose the history of this channel where it's going to go but other than that troops thank you very much for stopping by make sure you like share and subscribe to the channel if you want to become a member and support this because i am doing it every day i'd really appreciate that memberships uh, the link's in the description. You can just press the join button, guys. But if you want to speak to me personally, join the Discord. Link is in the description. But I'll see you next time, troops. Peace out.